Hey, investors. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, my name is Michael from Deep Value Returns on Seeking Alpha, uh, where I run a premium newsletter that talks about growth stocks and value stocks. Uh, Manuel, do you want to say a little bit about you? Yep, I'm Manuel. You can read all of my stuff at allinstocks.com. And today we're going to be talking about a company that Michael is bringing us. What is the name of the company, Michael? So the company is called Uploving. Um, it's quite exciting to bring this one up, particularly right now, because uh, a, lot of ad, uh, a lot of ad tech companies and a lot of growth companies have just sold off so substantially um, in the past several months. So I think this is quite an interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure if you have the time to have a kind of a look at it. Do you have time to have a look at it a little bit? Mm -hmm, I have. I, cool, cool. I've read I, both of your pieces on the on the company. Cool, and cool. actually interested. Okay. So, so very interested in knowing more about it. So what I, just before we kind of go into the company and everything, I just wanted to kind of talk about what is particularly interesting to me as an investor. So I don't really care about charting or anything like that. But it's quite interesting to me is that in the past uh, three months, a lot of tech companies are just like just been brutally sold off. Upstart, which I own, is down 70%. But there's loads of these that are down sub substantially. And in that comparison, there's a few names that have kind of held their ground slightly. Uploving is one of them. But what is particularly interesting about Uploving is that the other names, for example, the trade desk that everyone loves, you know, Uploving it hasn't got that big, that much of a following. And if you look at the number of articles on Seeking Alpha, you look at the volume of the number of shares traded, it's really like nobody's really interested in this. And we're talking about a company, I think it's approximately uh, 27, 28 billion market cap. So it's kind of like, you know, it's not a, a, a tiny company. You know, it's like it's a really big company. And in that background, it hasn't really done much uh, in the past three months, which I'm grateful for, obviously. But it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Do, do you have kind of any, before we kind of get to talking about it, do you have any kind of ideas? Do you want to kind of... I, I, would I would love for you to explain how the business makes money. And mm -hmm. for what I understand, there are two segments, how mm -hmm. they interact mm -hmm. and take it from there. Okay, so the most interesting thing straight away to think about is that this is a business that is kind of like an advertising business. Let's say you have an app, okay? You've designed an app and it's like the most amazing fitness app. How do you get that app to surface within either, the, let's say, the Google Store or the, the Apple Store? You're competing with so many different fitness uh, apps and it's going to be really, really difficult for you to get that content to be discovered, even if it's great, you know, it's going to take a long time. It might have fizzled out all the passion about it. And what Uploving does, it helps that surface. So the way to do it is, let's say you as a gamer, okay, you're a gamer, you're playing on your little uh, uh, sports and fitness uh, apps and whatever. And what Uploving holds as a library is approximately 300 games. And these are casual games. These are free to play. So you don't have to pay to play the game. You just, you're free to play. And you spend time engaged in these apps and these games. And every so often, an advert will show up. And it's like, oh, do you like uh, things about fitness? Then try out this free app. And obviously, you may or may not. It's like, it's like any advert in the world. You may or may not get influenced by that and kind of download um, the new app. So you just click the button and it kind of downloads in the background. And you, you get the new app on your phone. And for that, app loving will take a, a bit of a slice. So this side of the business is called, it's kind of not very imaginatively called, it's called the apps revenue segment. It's not very, it's not, they, are, they could have come up with a bit more of a catchy name, but it doesn't matter. So this is the bulk of the business. 75% of the business is comes from apps revenue. So they take a slice for advertising. So that's one part, but that's not what I'm particularly excited about right here. What I'm particularly excited about is what they've called the business software segment. This is really the crown show. This accounts for approximately 25% of uploading. So if you think of uploading as a business, they have the advertising side of the business, they can try and make apps discoverable, and that's kind of okay. But the business software segment gives you the tools to be able to measure as an advertiser the success of the app, to be able to measure the, the engagement, to be able to measure any kind of the key performance metrics that you need to figure out just how much the audience is resonating or not. 
is it worthwhile to spend more marketing dollars in promoting? Because ultimately, as an advertiser, you're only going to send more dollars towards the, the, the marketplace if you can actually get a return on investment. Like right? that's just you know investing one on one. So you need to kind of make sure, and they give you the tools. Now, just for context, because some people might not understand this very much. So if you look back and look at Snap, the, the company, Snapchat, and in Q3, they dramatically sold off. And the reason why they sold off is because when Apple made the changes on the iOS, you're not able to track the, the, the third party data as successfully. So in the case of Snapchat, you know, they had a bit of a setback because they're not, when they come, the advertiser comes to them, they're like, how successful is my advert? I have no idea, you know? I now have to use your software, the Snap software to check out when it's inside your platform, when it's outside your platform, I have to use the Apple software. And it's a bit confusing and it's, you know, for advertisers, being able to measure, have the tools to measure the success of the ad is really, really important. And in the case of app loving, this is really a high margins business for them, but they don't give you any kind of granularity on it. They tell you like what the consolidated total uh, free cash flow is of the business, which we'll come to later. But essentially, just to think about it, there are two sides of the business. There's the big side, which is the advertising side, is 75% of the business, and there's a small side. The small side, which is the business software side, is 25%, but it's growing really, really fast. Does, does this make sense so far? Yep, completely. Okay, so within that business uh, software side, what I've always found is to be really instructive and insightful to understand whether the business has the potential to be a success or not, is to follow the customer. Now, just let me take a back step here one second. So it doesn't matter how you invest. You can be investing on, let's say, an hourly basis, a yearly basis, or a 10-year basis. It doesn't matter. All you're trying to do is compound your portfolio over time. But what you need within that is conviction to stick to your strategy, because no strategy works perfectly every day, right? You're going to have, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you need conviction that your strategy works. And for me, the way that I build conviction is trying to understand either the user growth or the customer growth. If I see, like in the case of app loving, that the, the number of customers within the business software was up 316% year over year, that's not including any kind of um, acquisitions. That's just them organically compared to the previous 12 months. So anytime a business does an acquisition, they have, uh, over the next 12 months, they have inorganic growth. But if you subtract out the new acquisition, because if you include a new acquisition, the number of customers was actually up 358% year over year. So, but just forget the acquisition that they made, just look at what they've made relative to the previous year is up more than 300%. So with that in mind, you see that the clients, they call it um, uh, special uh, enterprise uh, clients or something like that. As, and it doesn't matter, just customers essentially. The, the customer is resonating so strongly that they have approximately net retention rate. That means uh, how, how much, how sticky the, the product is, is approximately 150%. And you get a lot of retention within the cohort, but you still get also a huge bump in the number of customers coming to your platform. So this to me is kind of like, okay, um, there is some kind of question marks which one could make how viable is a strategy long-term in terms of acquisitions, but just the kind of framework, if it makes sense, so far, what I'm kind of describing uh, in terms of um, mm -hmm. what the business does and how the customer sees the potential for the business. So that makes sense so far. Yeah, I've got one or two minor mm -hmm. questions, um, yeah. which are, for instance, in the advertising business, I, I understand that they have a strong uh, first party data. Uh, so I've, I play Sudoku in, mm -hmm. uh, on the iPad and every once in a while I get it's free to play. So I get uh, some advertisements but the thing is those ads aren't really relevant to me how do these guys show uh, relevant ads i know that they have first party data so they have a lot of, of a lot of data but the first ad so they understand if i like boats or if i like tennis or whatever how do they get it that that that's one uh, so how strong is the how important is the first data first party data um, and then the second part, the analytics, from what I understood um, from your uh, from your explanation, is it's basically an analytics platform, right? So you, do they gain access to your all of your metrics and then just 
put it out there on a on a dashboard and a cool neat dashboard is that it so i don't think that they so i'll take the, the, I'll, I'll try and take the first part of the question so uh, in the case of your sudoku game they the person the, the app developer that made the, the game may or may not be the actual owner of the of that game itself so they may be adverts above the sudoku game which are not related to the company that made a Sudoku game. So in that example, just hypothetically, it would be a third party data. So that doesn't have a lot of value because they don't know who you are. They don't know anything about you. They don't know if you're male, female, they don't know anything. Like they don't know your interests. So it's not very valuable to them. And that's why they're targeting you with quote unquote mass advertising. It's like stuff that you don't care about. You're never gonna get resonate with that. You're never gonna click on that. It doesn't matter to you. In the case of uh, uh, uploading, so, they have 300 games, which they own, and they've acquired over time. And in fact, I saw some data somewhere. I'm just going to try and surface it real quick. I think that out of the 10 free-to-play, uh, top 10 free-to-play games, I believe that they had uh, two games. They, so, so they had two games within the top 10 most downloaded games. So it's clearly games that resonate very much with the community, and it's 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 they own the, the IP on that on that game, and they will own all the information that comes out of it. So how many hours do you spend engaged with? What hours do you spend engaged with? Is it morning? Is it night? Is it what, what kind of person? What does it do? What does the person go and play after this game? You know, kind of this kind of information is really, really valuable. So that kind of gives you some insight into the first party data. Because and that over time, it also becomes like a reinforcing mechanism. Because the more they know about you, the more they, they know what you're going to go for next. It just builds up slowly over time because much mm -hmm. more valuable you become so valuable to the company but not on day one just over time just understanding that mm -hmm. about the analytics portion of the of, of the equation so it's just how to like as you said it's a software side on it's like it's kind of like you can think of it although now it has a kind of bad connotation software as a business as a service so because all the SaaS stocks are sold off but it's really what mm -hmm. it is you know it's it, it's a SaaS business on top of a advertising business so, I, you know, it's cliche, but it's really the best of both worlds. You get a really strong amount of customer retention because the customer recognizes, okay, you know, this blows my mind. I spend, let's say, X amount and I get a very large return. Now, like any advertising business, there is a, the, the extra marginal dollar decreases the value of your return on investment. So the first, let's say $10, you get a, like a really huge bump, but after a while it will saturate. So, but the customer seriously says, okay, you know, and that's why they have like something like 150% net retention rate over the last several quarters because the customer's like, okay, this is, makes a lot of sense to me. I'm, it's really compelling and it's worthwhile uh, investing and staying on the platform here. Um, so I think that like, just to give some context to some numbers here. So I was kind of calculating here and I was looking at this. So the business doesn't, as I already kind of talked about a few times, the business doesn't have a lot of um, capex, so it's a business that kind of what you uh, make in terms of the cash flow for operations. You're not having to invest in terms of capital expenditure. You could make the the argument, which is a very valid argument, and I stand by that. That if you're acquiring, if you're a serial acquirer, therefore that should be factored in to the amount of a, into a kind of capex requirement because you know you have to buy new games to kind of re re replenish your library. So there is that argument. So that, that's the way they grow, right? They acquire uh, other companies uh, with games, right? It's yes, the, correct. The turf so, is, it's online games, right? Okay. That's right. But they also, uh, every so often, make an acquisition. Like recently, they made an acquisition which will complete now this month from Twitter. So they've bought a mob pub uh, from Twitter for about a billion dollars of cash. And this is going to supplement their business side. So it's so they do make acquisitions for the games, but the, every so often they also make acquisitions for the, the business side. But what I find particularly compelling about this business is that historically, over the, the since its inception, whenever they've made an acquisition over the next 12 months, that business, since they've acquired it, is up approximately 100% year over year. So I think that, you know, that just kind of gives you some impression that, this founder-led business is very much um, able to buy up companies with 
very being very prudent that it actually fits into their overall strategy. So whenever they make an acquisition, they've been able to show that it's able to grow by 100% over the next uh, 12 months. Now, just one more thing. So as we look through to the business right now, Q3, for example, that they reported uh, back in November, it was up 90% year over year. Okay, it's a very strong growth rate, right? The problem is that as we go into Q4, they're only pointing to be up approximately 40% year over year. And that's because Q4 of last year was particularly strong for them. That being said, management has said, okay, we believe that we have what it takes to grow our cash flows from operations over the next, uh, over the long term at 30% compounded. So, you know, normally a business would say, okay, I can, we can grow uh, the cash flow from operations at 30% for the next two years or two, two to three years or something like that. But they believe, you know, that they have really what it takes to kind of over a very long period of time, let's say plus five years to grow at um, 30%. And that's just, you know, so much visibility. And that, again, does not necessarily circle back to the advertising business. That mostly circles back to the business side of the, of the segment. So I think that that's kind of uh, something that is particularly um, insightful right here. So, yes, it's going to be some bumpy quarters. But I think that overall, if a business can grow 30% compounded, you know, I think that's really, really attractive. Um, did you have anything you wanted? Did I answer your questions about the yeah. analytics and, and the first party data? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Okay. I don't know what else you want to mention, but, but yeah. one thing that is uh, on my mind is uh, it's obviously what are the risks and um, competition. Okay. Uh, is so this is it growth easily sustainable? What are the competitors doing? Uh, what are yeah. the main risks for, for this company? Okay, so the, the number one concern here for investors is that there is, a, you know, it's fueled by acquisitions. That'd be the one thing. If they somehow start, because every time you make an acquisition, they have to grow in size, right? It's like the Salesforce model. So you kind of make an acquisition, you digest it, and it's a very high risk uh, strategy because it may or it may not work out. So if you kind of it's very difficult to do that over the long term. So that's the one thing that I think, because the apps segment right now, this advertising and ad tech and, uh, it's, and analytics is a very hot space in the market right now. So you, you are having to acquire increasingly large businesses, which are not going to come cheaply. So that's the number one risk. Can they continue to acquire? The second thing, talking about the competition. So there are a few competitors they do kind of similar-ish things. Not directly similar, but similar-ish. One of them is called Iron Source. So Iron Source was a company that they came as a, I think it came as a SPAC last year. And everyone was like, this is Thomas Bravo led. And have you heard of Thomas Bravo? You might have heard them. Do you know Thomas Bravo? Bravo? Okay, they're the VC, venture capital, uh, um, venture capitalists in California, and everyone's like, oh my God, Thomas Bravo, Thomas Bravo, like, they're like, like, they're really good at what they do. They really have a very long track record uh, starting in uh, 1999, I think. Uh, they just like, just very, very, very uh, strong track record uh, of, of basically only focusing on software stocks for more than like 20 odd years. Uh, so these guys like, they, they know what they're doing. Um, they're, 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 they're very, um, very focused and very price conscious as well. Uh, particularly coming out of the, of the dot com bus, you know, kind of you learn a lot of lessons. I actually heard listened to them on an interview recently, so I, you know, I I get that 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 feel. So Iron Source is backed by Thomas Bravo. Iron Source does something kind of similar. So Iron Source has got two segments as well, and one of the segments kind of overlays with this um, with what uh, App Loving does, which is discoverability and monetization of the apps, helping the app owner, the app developer, this get the app more discovered and giving them the tools to better monetize. So that very much overlaps with um, what App Loving does. Uh, the other side of the segment that it does is this kind of um, business analytics, but it's much more about content creation and how to kind of, uh, they kind of give you the tools to be able to make compelling games, a bit like Unity technology. So. It's a space that obviously has a lot of competition. So it's not that there's only one player, but when you see that the company is growing at approximately, let's say, somewhere in the ballpark of 40 to 50%, there's, there's a long runway that a business can continue to grow 
uh, before kind of in slowing down and competition meaningfully just derailing you. So just to give you uh, some context here. So by my estimations, uh, this year, uh, up leveling is going to make approximately 500 million of free cash flow. And so this for this year, up leveling is priced at approximately 60 times this year's free cash flow. And that sounds really expensive for value pay, you know, like normally like by nine or 10 times free cash flow. But the business is growing at like, such a fast rate, you don't need like many years of it growing at approximately somewhere in the ballpark of 40 to 50%. If you get two or three years, your margin of safety builds really, really quickly. Uh, now, I know a lot of kind of uh, value guys are kind of like, oh, you know, I don't pay more than nine times a free cash flow. And with the benefit of hindsight, if you only bought this type of stuff for nine, 10 times free cash flow in the past 12 months, you bought all the cyclical stuff, you'd be absolutely killing the market. You know, you look at mining stocks, you look at uh, all kinds of cyclical stuff, uh, shipping stocks, everything. Is just like, so you're doing really, really well. But I don't know personally if that is something that can be sustained. But more importantly, as I said at the start of the video, it's really about building the conviction to kind of stay the course. Uh, just want to do... Uh... So yeah, so essentially, I don't, I, I don't think personally that if you got a business where the CEO owns approximately $6 billion of equity in the business. He has 19% uh, ownership in the company that paying 60 times free cash flow is too expensive. I think that, you know, you've got a business that balance sheet is clean, makes a lot of free cash flow. There's a question mark, which may or may not be expensive paying 60 times free cash flow for a business that's clearly growing at somewhere between, you know, 40 to 50% compounded for a number of years. Um, it, it is, I mean, if you get, if you're able to have the conviction to hold for this approximately, let's say two years, I think that it could easily grow into your margin safety. But, you know, like everything in, 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 in investing, it's just, it doesn't matter what the charge is, as long as you have the conviction to kind of say, I don't know how these things are gonna work out. Uh, I'm willing to kind of, uh, let time do its thing. It's not about trying to time the market and being really intelligent here. It's just the time spent in the market with the company being the owner of that business. And uh, yeah, I think that's um, Whenever I look at a company at 60 times earnings or 60 times free cash flow, I get pause and I think, what is this implying? And are these growth rates um, sustainable? And Usually I don't pay that much, but first of all, 60 times might be cheap. It might be expensive. It's mm -hmm. not just a number per se. It's yeah. got a lot of drivers, as you say, behind it, uh, the growth rate, reinvestment rate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I always uh, pause a bit when I see 60 times uh, earnings. And I always go back to uh, Microsoft in the 2000, 1999, mm -hmm. 2000, it was trading at 62 times earnings and then investors it, it it never stopped growing it it went on to growing for until today mm -hmm. but for the next 14 years because investors were willing to pay a, a lot lower multiple than 60 times earnings i don't know mm -hmm. 14 15 mm -hmm. uh, they were left they were red for 14 or 15 years a good way that i believe for it works for me and this this should be noted it works for me is that what happens if the company grows at this rate and then you've got to do your own work and uh, estimate uh, what do you think it's going to be doing in revenues in the future if it goes uh, if it grows on this rate at this rate but investors are willing to pay a lot less than those 60 times earnings do i still get a good investment does this mm. my estimate to give me a good a good uh, uh, growth rate in the future, a rate of return in the future. That's how I go about it. There's many ways to go about these things, yeah. of course, but that, that's what I like to do is to think if investors now are willing to pay 60 times, but Microsoft, they were willing to pay 62 times as well. And then they weren't from one minute to the other. Mm -hmm. So what if that happened? Is this still a promise of a good investment? If it is, that's when I usually buy it. Um, but of course, it depends on your research, on your estimates. So two things. In the case of Microsoft, it was prices, let's say, I don't know, you say 60 times at times earnings, but it was in a market environment where you could get the 5% yield on a bond. So with interest rates of 5%, yeah, 60 times earnings is like, what's the point of that? That's obviously killing your return. 
uh, in the market environment that we are now, where you get approximately 1.8%, it's that context. Secondly, if you look at, let's say the case, let's say Apple, for example, Apple is priced at approximately 40 times earnings. And most investors, most analysts, there's an army that follows this company, you know, from China, every single ship checking everything. And most investors kind of believe that it's going to grow at approximately on the top line at approximately five to eight percent over the next two, three years. So you're paying 40 times uh, earnings for a business that I know it has a lot of uh, um, share repurchases and stuff like that. But ultimately, you know, you can only repurchase so much of the business, right? You, you, you kind of have to grow the business at some point in time. Uh, and in that context, you're paying 40 times earnings for a business that may or may not be growing at 10%, which I, I think would struggle, but let's say it grows 10% over the next two, three years, or you pay 60 times for a business that is so young and nimble that it has, you know, you can grow at that period for a period of time. And um, But everything in investing, you know, is always like, in we, you and I always discuss, you know, we look at this today and today we're kind of like really passionate and then we kind of feel like in six months time, it's like, ah, oh, what were we thinking? You know, what was I thinking? And you never know the future. You just have to kind of try your best to, be the owner of the business by stagger your entry to dollar cost average over, let's say, a period of, let's say, six months. Because once you're the investor of the business, you continue to learn a lot about being an investor of the business. You and I are talking about Microsoft. We, I don't think you own, I don't own Microsoft. You kind of have some ideas. But if you buy a share of Microsoft over the next six months, you're going to learn a lot about that business. And it's different being the owner of the business and kind of just saying, oh, I think that Microsoft may do this with Azure. I think that, you know, uh, so like with skin in the game, you're much more committed to see how things play out. But anyway, we'll just have to see how it goes. And just before we kind of wrap up, I think that it's interesting to talk about that we're going to start earning season now. Uh, it's going to be, hopefully people will kind of be quite interested to see what we talk about that. Uh, I'm sure some of your companies are going to be reporting in the next three weeks or so, uh, three, four weeks. Uh, so my companies, and it's going to be a really interesting period. And I hope that the, uh, People will kind of enjoy it. Yeah. That's it okay. for today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.